Take these simple a couple of trips, tips and tricks, if you will, for safe boating practices, whatever kind of boat you have. Now, you guys in the back, you know you're allowed to come a little bit forward, right? I promise you, I won't bite, I won't heckle, I won't yell at you or nothing. You're allowed to come up if you want. My name is Rick Lazell. I'm the CEO of an organization called Boating Ontario. We are the organization that does a tremendous amount of the advocacy on behalf of the industry. The one thing that most boaters will reflect on, we're the guys that got the marinas open when COVID hit back in 2020. That's part of what our organization did. We also do a lot of education. We do a lot of workforce development for our sector, as well as obviously a lot of lobbying. And I'm an avid boater. Okay, for a prize, does anybody know where our boat is right there? You know where that is? Anybody got it? No? Quartz Lakes. Nope, not Quartz Lakes. Big Shoot Marine Railway. We are on our way between, we keep our boat in Aurelia, we are heading up to Georgian Bay for one of our many trips up there. I don't love, please don't make assumptions. It's fair game. If you have a question, jump in and ask the question. I'm happy to answer uh, to the best of my ability today. A couple of quick slides about shared waterways. Uh, well, the, uh, 34 years I've been in the recreational boating industry. We've never seen more growth and more uh, density on our waterways than we have in the last four years. And you know, there's, there's the stereotypical side of it that it's all the wakeboard boaters and it's all the young guys and everything. It's not just the wakeboarders. It's folks like us with Karen and I have a, uh, a 32 foot regal. It's cruisers. It's a lot of issues out there. Two messages from this. Your wake is your responsibility from the back of your transom until it hits the shoreline. The impact of your wake is all the way until that wake hits the shoreline. So you gotta think about that. If you're going through a fairly narrow passageway, like the Narrows in Aurelia, and there's boats sitting tied up to the docks, and you're going, well, I'm running at 10 kilometers because the sign says I'm allowed to run at 10 kilometers, but you're throwing a wake that big, you're causing a lot of havoc and a lot of chaos in the docks. Just slow that transom down, just slow the boat down a little bit. And the same thing with sound. You know, boats have evolved. I've been in the boat business for 33 or 34 years, and sound on the water carries tremendously far. So, you know, we've got some boats out there now with 1,000 and 2,000 watt sound systems. I'm a rock and roll guy. I love loud music until my wife tells me to turn it down. But let me tell you, the carry on the water is like nothing you've ever seen. So we gotta be mindful of that kind of stuff. Somebody said to me, it's just like driving a car, Rick, you jump Attention. in a boat, you go for a drive, and there's markings when we're on the road, there's signs Daddy everywhere. Lee. Daddy Lee, if you are in the building, please meet Diana at the show office, Salon 103 sure in Hall A. That's Danny Lee. So there's signs on the highway, there's speed limits, there's yield signs and everything else. The problem is you get out in the water, there's none of that, right? Once in a while, we've got a slow speed zone, we've got a no wake zone, we've got channel markers and marker boys to think of, but all the things we're accustomed to on the 401 don't exist on Lake Simcoe or Lake Ontario or the Quarthas or anywhere else that we're out there. So safety is simple. The campaign that Boating Ontario created with the help of Transport Canada, we've got 1.6 million hits on YouTube with this campaign already. There's four key messages here. We're gonna talk a little bit about life jacket wear. We're gonna talk about alcohol and drug use on the water. And then we're gonna talk about two contentious issues that hugely affect our sport. And that's the moment we arrive at the launch ramp on Saturday morning to back the boat trailer in and realize we don't know how. And that's also the moment when we arrive at the marina and we realize we've never backed or parked a boat at a dock at a marina. So we're gonna talk about launching and we're gonna talk about docking as well. We'll kick it off with a quick little video here on Did life jacket. Did you know that the inflatable style of PFD or life jacket is only legal if you're wearing it. Otherwise, it doesn't count as one of your PFDs or life jackets. And you can't wear them legally if you're under 16. If you're looking for more information on how to find or fit a life jacket or PFD, go to BoatingOntario.ca. How many years did I say I've been boating? 30 something, fair enough, you win the first prize, Graham. 30 something years, two years ago at this boat show, I learned that inflatable life jackets don't count unless you're wearing them. So the message is, if you're on the water, if you've got four guests on your boat, and you have two inflatables, 
and two PFDs like the one in the middle, and you get pulled over, if you're not wearing those inflatables, you're not legal. You have to be wearing them for them to count. On our boat, we keep a dozen life jackets. We use inflatables on our, on our subs and stuff. Uh, but we, we absolutely have uh, lots of life jackets on the boat. One person on board, captain and crew understand this. When you have guests at board, it is your responsibility to make sure that there is a PFD that fits all of your guests. The cops are not gonna say, yeah, we'll give you a pass because that one doesn't fit. It's not gonna save their life if they need it. It's your responsibility every time you take guests out on your boat to make sure that there is a PFD or life jacket that fits every one of them. Readily accessible. We've got a 32 foot cruiser with a V berth down below. It's about three steps from my helm to get down there and get to where our life jackets are kept. Perfectly fine. What they don't wanna see, and I talked to a friend of mine from the OPP last year, they pull over an older 23 foot closed deck boat. The operator said, well the life jackets are underneath the, the closed deck. It took them nine minutes to get to the life jackets. That's not accessible and that doesn't work. So they're just looking for you to say that the life jackets are accessible. This is a really hot topic in the province of Ontario. There is, so let me tell you, there is no legal law that says children must wear a life jacket today. And I stress today. I can tell you my kids were never allowed out of the truck at the marina until they put their boat coat on. That's what we called it. We called it a boat coat because it wasn't a life jacket. It was a boat coat and they smiled that, like that young lady smiling right there because it's a boat coat, it catches. But the kids knew they had to put it on. And my kids had to wear them at all times until they were 16. There is a really important message here on fit for kids. If you pull the life jacket up and it's up around their ears, it's not going to save their lives. So you've got to make sure you're making sure they fit properly each year when you're taking the kids out. The Pink Flamingo is legally not a vessel. But I can tell you horror stories that my friends in Water and Marine Enforcement have told us about people that stopped at Walmart or Costco, bought a Pink Flamingo, went to Georgian Bay and they found them a day later up in Tiny Township. Alive, thankfully. Human powered watercraft is the biggest challenge we face on the water right now. That is the biggest area where we're seeing issues. We have two paddle boards. We absolutely wear our life jackets when we ride our boards. Canoes and kayaks are the biggest challenges that we're facing out there right now. The technology advancements in life jacket quality and fit and comfort over the last 10 years is like nothing I've ever seen. To me, if you're gonna run human powered, you should absolutely have a life jacket on at all times. Did when you it know comes that to if you're voting and found to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you will lose your driver's license. Safety is simple. Have a plan. When voting, don't drink alcohol or do drugs. For more information, go to votingontario.ca. So the message there is the license that you're going to lose is not the one that you're required to have to drive the boat. You're going to lose your driver's license. That's the one they'll take. It's pretty simple, just don't drink and vote. It's really not rocket science. We get a lot of questions on, what about if I'm just going across the lake to a friend's cottage, can I take a few beers with me? The answer is, if they are sealed, uh, if the operator's sober, number one, if they're sealed, all bottles, cans, packages, and packages, then yes, the marine enforcement will allow you to move that product. If anything's open, you're in a very different conversation. So you can be the captain and be stone cold sober. If you're moving your boat in the province of Ontario and the rules are different as we go across Canada, if you are mobile on that boat and somebody is drinking an open beer, you're gonna have a problem. You cannot be mobile and have alcohol open when you're on the water. In Ontario, if your boat is equipped with a, love this, this came right out of the safe boating guide, toilet as in we call it a head, cooking facilities, as in the galley, sleeping quarters, as in your V-berth or mid-cabin. Yes, your pastors may consume alcohol, but the boat must be anchored or docked. Okay, there's two boats up there. Which one's legal to be having an open beer right now? Can you tell? Sorry? Okay, the sailboat is actually not legal. Okay, you can't see it from the back. 
but my ladder's down, this is our boat, my ladder's down and my bow, my bow anchor's down. The sailboat is fully underway. You cannot consume alcohol underway in the province of Ontario. It is against the law. All right, let's learn, talk about launching because this really is a big one in our sector. Uh, we know that there's been lots of challenges over the years on the launch ramps. Did you know, when backing up a trailer, you will notice the back of the trailer turns the opposite direction to the direction you turn your steering wheel. That's why it's important to practice before you get to the launch ramp. Safety is simple. Have a plan. Learn how to launch your boat. For more information, go to VotingOntario.ca. When we launched the campaign last year, I remember when Leslie on my team put that particular vignette out on social media. The amount of responses of, well, you've got to have your hands here. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Everybody that is an experienced captain and knows how to back up a boat trailer has an opinion or a thought on how to do it. The one thing I'm going to tell you is the wrong time to learn is Saturday morning at the ramp when there's 50 other boats there and 49 of them are experts. It's probably not going to be a great moment. My suggestion to you is go to the ramp Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday morning or go find an empty parking lot and learn how to back up there. The toughest trailers to back up when it comes to jackknifing are single axle trailers. I would rather take the trail, the tandem axle trailer that we had on our old board, our 23, I could back that trailer up and put either axle on a dime. A single axle personal watercraft trailer or for a 12 foot tinny, they are the toughest little trailers to back up no matter what you're doing. Going slow is a huge part of the message here. Huge part of the message of managing to move a trailer. There's some etiquette for the launch ramp. Right? There's things that we can do at home before we head to the ramp. There's a lot of our gear, whether you're going fishing, skiing, tubing, whatever your day and your plan is, there's a lot of things that we can do starting at home. And it starts with conversation, captains, with the entire crew for the day. All of this is not just one person's responsibility. But get some of your gear loaded. If you're going to do a vessel check before you go out, and you should, make sure you're doing that before you leave the house. When you get near, not on the ramp, when you get near the ramp, that's when you put your drain plug back in. It is law in the province of Ontario. If you are a transient boater, you must pull your drain plug when you come out of the water. Put it in before you get on the ramp. Get your lines and your fenders ready. Get your canvas off. Stow your tie downs. This is all, you're parked over here, the ramp's over there. The person that is ready is going in the water. You've got all that done, you've got your coolers, your gear, and everything's ready to go. Now you slide the boat trailer down the ramp, you get your boat safely launched, and you promptly clear the ramp, especially back in we're at Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and there's 50 expert captains in that line. Right? So you want to make sure you're doing that. That's just simple etiquette on the ramp. I have literally witnessed fist fights at boat launches absolutely unnecessary if we just remember the etiquette. I watched a gentleman with about a 24 foot pontoon two years ago. He pulled up to the ramp, single ramp, blocked the ramp for 45 minutes. He had done nothing. There were seven other boats waiting in line, ready to go. It's little stuff like this that's going to create the better experience for all of us when we're out there. All right, the last one we've got is on docking. We'll start with one more video from Jeff Did Sinclair. You know that one of the most important things about leaving the dock or approaching the dock is having a plan and sharing that plan with the people on your boat so they can help. Learn how to dock your boat by practicing in a controlled environment. For more information, go to boatingontario.ca. Lots of feedback on that one too about, you know, the lines weren't done right or this wasn't done right. The bottom line is we want to share about the importance of, do of docking. Practice makes perfect. This is just like the, the launch ramp, right? Saturday afternoon pulling into the marina the very first time you're, you're docking the boat is probably going to be a contentious moment because all of your fellow boaters are around you watching. It's a great moment. We took delivery of our Regal on a, on a Thursday and you know we took time to make sure we got off the dock with that uh, when it wasn't busy. Conditions will affect your approach. You have to think about that. I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier to the captains in the room. 
The most important thing you can do is communicate with your crew. I talked to somebody a year ago that said, he, he, a buddy of his, and this was somebody in the Marine Enforcement world, he said a buddy of his was so upset they went out on the weekend with, the, with their kids, and as they were coming into the, to the marina, the guy had to crawl over the teenagers to get the lines and the fenders out. Do we see the problem? Get the teenagers involved. When my kids were putting on their boat coats, they learned how to tie a fender. They learned how to set a line and get a line ready. They, they were part of the solution, and they always have been part of the solution. Hire a trainer. Most of my life has been around small, single engine boats. We go out three years, or four years ago, we buy this 32 with twin engines and a generator and, and big blocks. And I hired a trainer and had somebody come up and spend four hours with us. And then we had another trainer come up and spend some time with Karen to talk about her role and her responsibilities with this thing. There's nothing wrong with bringing somebody in to help you. And there are experts and professionals in the industry that do that for a living. Um, no shame in a port. I pulled into the port of Aurelia uh, about two months after we bought the boat and all our neighbors from the marina, it was a bad moment, all our neighbors from the marina were there, so they're all watching. And I pull in and I misread the current in the port of Aurelia and my neighbor beside me that's got a big, big Silverton, he says, Rick, just a port. And I'm looking, I'm going, I'm full of testosterone, I can't abort. He said, just a port, go back out, calm down, bring the boat back in, and we did that, and it was perfect. There's nothing wrong with saying this one isn't gonna work. Communications, I already hammered on this one. Share the plan with your crew. Tell your crew what you're gonna do as you're coming in. Ask, have your crew be involved. Everybody plays a role in safe boating practices when we're out there, and update it. Because as you're coming off the lake into the harbor, we had one set of situations on the lake, now we're in the harbor, we, the wind has come a different direction, something has changed. Communicate with your crew that there's a change in the plan, that's perfectly okay. Couple of tips for you. On the water, I look at, we look at top water. So we're looking at that skim going across the canal as we're coming down our, our, our channel. We come into Marina Del Rey, we go down a channel, we make a hard left turn at our actual channel where we are. We're the first boat, so I've got to immediately spin the boat 90 degrees and back it in. We also look at flags. Every boat, most boats have flags on them. If not, the marina's got flags. Look at what the flags are doing. Look at treetops. All those three things are things that'll tell you what's going on. This is where you can also engage the crew again. Give the kids the binoculars and make it a game for the first one that's gonna find out which way the wind's going. Get them involved in it. Whether knowledge and respect equals a great decision-making moment. I use three different apps when we're out there. We use Windy, Predict Wind, and the Weather Network. The sailing community, I understand, uses Windy, and if the sailing community trusts, trusts that app as a power motor, I'm good with that. And it has absolutely saved our bacon more than once using these different apps so we understand what's going on on the waterways out there. A um, couple of resources for you. Uh, there are some, the Transport Canada Safe Boating Guide is full of information on good safe boating practices. Uh, our organization publishes a directory that lists all the marinas in the province. I think we've got a dozen or so of them here at the front. Um, our website, all the safety simple tools are there online. Our safe boating guide, this link to the Transport Canada safe boating guide digitally is there as well as our own directory. There's lots and lots of information there. Canadian Power Squadrons is a wonderful resource, lots of tools there. Transport Canada's Office of Boating Safety, again, lots and lots of information through them and the Canadian Safe Boating Council. All of these organizations have lots of digital information to help you. We want to help you get better boating experiences so you'll stay on the water longer and be with us as, as time progresses. Thanks very much, folks. I appreciate your attention. I hope you really enjoy the rest of the Toronto International Boat Show. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Sorry. Yes.